Today we're going to uh, look at uh, this uh, idea of uh, uh, probably approximately correct learning, uh, which um, uh, is, can give us a more solid theoretical grounding on most of the things we've been seeing so far. Uh, so uh, previously we saw this idea of underfitting and overfitting, and in practice we uh, estimate this by something like cross-validation or training and validation, so we measure the error inside the training set and outside the training set. But then we saw a bit, looked a bit deeper when we did this bias and variance decomposition, also empirically by, by bootstrapping, but uh, to understand a bit, more, a bit better what is happening uh, inside the, the classifier or inside our models when we, we train them. Uh, today we're going to look at this a bit more formally and uh, try to get a more abstract understanding of these issues. So we're going to look first at, at this term, empirical risk minimization, uh, which is basically, on this first uh, lecture, we're going to look at risk merely as the probability of committing an error, of misclassifying. Then, in the second hour, we're going to expand this idea a bit more when we consider different uh, consequences of making mistakes. But for now, we're going to look at empirical risk minimization, basically, as uh, the same thing we've been doing so far, which is to try to minimize the probability of committing an error. And then we're going to look at this notion of probably approximately correct learning uh, and look at the relation between the size of the hypothesis class or the power of the hypothesis to uh, uh, classify some sets. So this would be uh, shattering in the VC dimension and see how these relate to the problem of generalizing from a training set to outside the training set. Okay, so let's start with empirical risk minimization. Uh, the, the idea of risk uh, more broadly takes into account both the probability of something, of some mistake, and the consequences of that mistake. So, uh, a 5% probability of dropping my keys is a lower risk than a 5% probability of a heart attack, even though the probability is the same. But uh, we'll start with looking at risk just as uh, uh, a problem of misclassification, of uh, uh, making a mistake in the classifier. So we have this idea of loss, of uh, how bad it is that things are going, but so far loss has been always a measure of the error. Uh, the quadratic error, the, the uh, one minus the accuracy or the fraction of mistakes, things like that. So basically the risk is the expected loss, is the, uh, the average over uh, all the events, all the future events. Okay? Uh, the empirical risk is the one that we can measure. So if we consider that loss is simply making a mistake, then if we count the fraction of mistakes that we are making in our uh, data set, uh, the, the set for which we have labels, then that would be an empirical measure of risk. So usually we are measuring this in the training set while we're fitting. We can also have some validation set or test set or something like that, but these are empirical measures. Um, the true risk would be the average over all the data. So if risk is only about making mistakes, this would be the true error rate. We cannot measure this, and typically uh, if we are measuring the, the empirical risk in the training set, we will underestimate the, the true risk. So before we start going a bit deeper on the, on the, the theory, uh, where the theory can lead us, I'm going just to cover these two basic notions here. So this is, uh, we're going to look at bounds on the probabilities of something happening. Uh, so we'll start with this simple bound, which is the probability given a set of random events, the probability of any of those events happening, at least one of them happening, is never greater than the sum of the probabilities of uh, either of them happening. So if the events are mutually exclusive, this will be equal. The probability of any of them happening is the sum of the probabilities. If there is some overlap, if they can co-occur, co then the probability of any of them happening will be lower than the sum of the probabilities. Okay? Uh, 
but it can never be higher than the sum of the probabilities. Uh, so the sum of all events does not necessarily need to be one unless the events cover all possibilities. So if you consider the events of raining or the umbrella falling off, then the sum is not one because there are many other things too that can happen. Okay? But if you consider the events that cover all the possibilities, then they have to sum up to one. But in general, they won't because we are not, uh, there are other things that, that may happen too. Okay? Uh, another thing that we'll use further on is this uh, Hoeffling's inequality. So imagine that we have these Bernoulli variables. These are ones that can be uh, zero or one, or a toss of a coin, something like that. And they, are, they all have the same distribution. So they have the same probability of being one. Uh, for example, they can be the probability of our classifier making a mistake. This is one of the uses we'll give. Uh, let's suppose that the real probability of being one is this phi. We generally don't know what it is. We cannot measure it. Uh, this would be something like the true error, the, the real probability of our classifier making mistakes. But we can measure the, uh, the frequency of, uh, with which these variables are one in some sample. So we have a sample of m of them, say m examples and we measure how many our classifier is going to be mistaken about. And so we can measure this average here, this phi with, with the hat, uh, in our sample. This would be an empirical measure. Now what Hosting's inequality tells us is that the probability of the measure that we are uh, making on this sample, so this average here, being distant from the true probability by more than gamma, so uh, on one side or the other, is always below e raised to minus 2 times gamma squared multiplied by m. So basically, this probability re uh, reduces as we increase the sample size. And this is intuitive. The, the larger the sample we have, the, the greater the chances that the, the measure the, of, of the average in this sample is going to approximate the true uh, expected value. So, so we can put these two together. This, uh, this goes for one side, so phi minus phi hat, and also phi hat minus phi. We can put them together and just consider twice the, the size of the, the interval, and this would be the absolute difference between what we measure in our sample and what the true value would be. So we're going back to this formula uh, uh, later on, but this is just some background uh, basics. So now, consider that we have uh, a set of, of binary classifiers. So this would be our hypothesis. And they all map between some universe where we have our features into two classes. They are binary classifiers, so class 0 or class 1. And we have uh, a sample, this S, which is a sample of examples from that universe of examples. This sample S, all the, the M examples were taken with the same probability distribution from the universe. The empirical error, which, for example, we're going to assume here that is the training error, the, the one we're measuring for selecting the best hypothesis, is uh, the, the error that we measure in one hypothesis, uh, which is basically the fraction of those incorrectly classified. So C is the, the true class of uh, each example. H of X is the, what the, the, class, the class that the hypothesis is telling us uh, the example belongs to. The true error will be, would be the expected value over all the universe. So the probability that the hypothesis would misclassify some example taken at random from all the universe of the example. We don't have a measure for this because we only have a sample uh, to measure these things in. Oh, the idea of uh, empirical risk minimization is that we find the best uh, set of parameters, for example, or the best hypothesis in general, by minimizing this empirical risk. So the empirical error in our case, we are not considering different loss functions at this stage, so the risk is basically just the risk of committing an error. So if we choose the hypothesis or the parameters for, the, for uh, some parametric model or just an hypothesis by minimizing the empirical uh, risk, we are doing empirical risk minimization. 
Now the question is, what does this imply for the true error? Because note that we are minimizing the empirical risk because that's what we can measure, but what we really want is a hypothesis that has a low true error because then it will work on different examples. So this is a bit like looking for our keys under the lamppost because that's where the light is, but we have no idea where the keys are. Okay? Uh, so now we're going to try to use that, those Husting inequality to uh, 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 compute bounds on the probability of getting some true error or some limits to the true error based on what we're doing, which is minimizing the empirical risk. Okay? So this leads us to this uh, probably uh, this pack learning here, but let's start first with some uh, just some uh, basic concepts. So I'm going to use that uh, that x large x there as the set of possible examples. So this is the universe where we take our data from, and there is a, a, an actual class for each of the examples. So this C represents the ground truth. Uh, the true class for each of the examples. Uh, we also have a hypothesis class. This large H means, uh, represents the, the set of hypotheses from which we are going to choose the best one. Uh, we have this distribution D from which we are going to take our sample and we have a training sample uh, that we are going to use to select the hypothesis. So the learner will receive this sample S all the elements of S are taken from the universe X with the same probability distribution. And now it's going to select one hypothesis from the hypothesis space that minimizes the empirical risk. So the, the risk or the error measured in the sample that we have here. So this is what we're doing with learning. We are minimizing the training error. Uh, if we genera generalize the idea, not only for error, but if we take into account the consequences of mistakes and so on, which we're going to look at later, we can use the general idea of minimizing the risk uh, that we are measuring on the training set. So the problem is that the true error of the hypothesis may uh, be greater than zero. That is, uh, even if we can find one that works well with our sample and can classify all the examples in our sample with no error. It may be that when we apply it outside uh, this sample, the predictions our hypothesis makes for all the, the elements in the universe do not coincide exactly with the classes of those examples. Okay. So this would be the true error for our hypothesis. <coughs> Okay, since the true error is the probability of making a mistake over all the, the universe, we cannot observe that. We only observe the empirical error, and this is what we are going to, to learn. One thing that it's not reasonable to demand is that our classifier has a true error of zero. Because in our sample, we cannot consider all possible examples because we only have a sample of, of all possible examples. So there are things that our learner will never meet. And uh, furthermore, what correlations we find in our sample may actually be misleading because we're only looking at some of the data. It seems like something works because it works on that training set, but actually it doesn't work outside the training set. So for these reasons, it's not reasonable to uh, demand that the best hypothesis we're going to choose based on the empirical error has is perfect for classifying everything and has a zero uh, true error. So how can we uh, establish the objectives of machine learning? So basically that's what we're talking about here. We cannot say that our goal is to have something that can perfectly classify every possible example because that's not a reasonable expectation. So this is what uh, where this idea of probably approximately correct learning comes from. It's a, a relaxation of those goals to a more realistic objective. So what we want is that the hypothesis that we choose, so the best hypothesis we choose using the, the training sample, has an error that is low. That is, this hypothesis is approximately correct. So the error is below some epsilon value there. But this 
we also cannot guarantee with 100% certainty. So actually, what we require is that the probability of our hypothesis, the one we chose, having a true error below this epsilon, is greater than 1 minus some delta, some, some slack that we are imposing here. Uh, and the requirements are simply that the hypothesis is approximately correct, that is, this delta is below 1 half, so we are getting things right more often than, than not. And the probability of this happening is also greater than 50%. So this delta is also a small value below one half. And this is the notion of probably approximately correct learning. Me meaning that with a greater than 50% probability, we are obtaining a hypothesis that has a true error below 50%. This is uh, it seems like a modest goal, but at least it's a more realistic one than just requiring uh, a zero through error. We also say that uh, we have an efficient, probably approximately correct learning if the time, the computational cost of learning increases only polynomially with, uh, uh, as we decrease the, the epsilon and decrease the delta. So if you want uh, the true error to be smaller with a larger probability, then this will increase polynomially in the, uh, uh, in the training time, and when that happens, then pack learning is polynomial. Now, we are assuming here for, for the, uh, the derivations I'm going to show uh, uh, going on from here, that the hypothesis class is finite, and that inside the hypothesis class, there is at least one hypothesis for which the true error is no larger than epsilon. So the hypothesis class must contain a hypothesis that meets this criteria. And uh, we are going uh, to uh, draw all our training and testing examples, and all the examples, uh, we are drawing them with the same probability distribution. So given these goals and these assumptions, what can we say about the relationship between the size of the training set, the probability of getting something approximately correct, and how approximately correct we can get it? So let's start with defining this idea of a consistent hypothesis. A consistent hypothesis is a, a hypothesis that classifies the training set with no errors. So the empirical error for that hypothesis is zero. The version space of our hypothesis class is the set of all hypotheses that have an empirical error of zero. So a set of all consistent hypotheses. So you can imagine that you have a, a class of hypotheses where you're going to choose the best one, and there is a set there, a subset of hypotheses, which all classify our training set with no mistakes. So, a consistent hypothesis minimizes the empirical error, because the error cannot be smaller than zero, and th those are those that minimize the empirical error. We have a consistent learner if the learner gives us a hypothesis inside the version space, so a consistent hypothesis. This means that when we train the learner, it will give us a, a hypothesis that results in zero errors on the training set. <coughs> Now, we can also talk about this uh, epsilon exhausted if uh, all the hypotheses uh, in the version uh, set have um, a true error below epsilon. So if this happens, if all the hypotheses in, uh, all the, the hypotheses in the version space, so all consistent hypotheses, have a true error below epsilon, then when our learner gives us a consistent hypothesis, the true error of that hypothesis will be below epsilon. So this gives us approximately correct uh, learning. Uh, it's not, the version space is not epsilon exhausted if there is at least one hypothesis inside the version space, that is one hypothesis with zero error on the training set that has a true error greater than epsilon. Now the problem is that we cannot tell which of the case is true. We, we cannot tell if there are any hypotheses in the, the um, uh, version space, so any consistent hypothesis with our training set that have a true error greater than epsilon, uh, because we cannot observe this, the, the true error. But we can try to estimate what are the probabilities of this happening. 
So the probability, what is the probability that no hypothesis inside the virtual space has a, a true error greater than epsilon? So let's consider uh, these hypotheses that are inside of our hypothesis class and they all have a, an error, a true error greater than epsilon. So we can switch this question around and ask what would be the probability of any, uh, or at least one of those hypotheses that has a true error greater than epsilon ending up inside the version space, that is, being an hypothesis that is consistent with a training set and gives a zero error on a training set, even though the true error is greater than epsilon. So the probability of this hypothesis being consistent with one example must be below 1 minus epsilon, because epsilon is the probability of error, and so the probability of the hypothesis correctly classifying our example, if the, the, uh, the true error of the hypothesis is greater than epsilon, the probability of classifying an example correctly must be less than 1 minus epsilon. The probability of being consistent with all the examples in our training set is just the product, is, must be below the product of all these, so 1 minus epsilon raised to m, where m is the size of the training set. So, if one hypothesis has a true error greater than epsilon, the probability of being consistent with all the examples in our training set must be below 1 minus epsilon raised to m. Now, we can ask what happens if we have several hypotheses with a true error greater than epsilon. Then, suppose that we have k hypotheses with a true error greater than epsilon, the probability of any of them being consistent with our training set must be below the product of this k by the probability of one of them being consistent with the training set. So this is that union bound that we saw earlier. Unfortunately, we don't know this k because we don't know how many hypotheses in our hypothesis class have uh, a true error greater than epsilon. But we know that k cannot be larger than the size of the hypothesis class because that's all the hypothesis. So at most, k is all the hypothesis. And so we can uh, conclude that we, uh, the probability of um, at least one hypothesis in uh, of our hypothesis class that has a true error greater than epsilon being consistent with our training set must be below the size of the hypothesis class multiplied uh, by 1 minus epsilon raised to the size of the training set. So this would be uh, an upper bound on the probability of there being in the set of hypotheses that is consistent with our training set an hypothesis that has a true error greater than epsilon. So we can, if we do this uh, approximation here, uh, we, we know that 1 minus epsilon is uh, l less than e raised to minus epsilon if epsilon is below 0 and 1, and since epsilon is the, the error rate, it must be between 0 and 1, then we can simplify this expression and we get this bound here. Uh, and now we have uh, the upper bound on the probability of uh, uh, having um, in our consistent learner that is going to give us an hypothesis that is consistent with the training set, not being able to discard our all hypotheses which have a true error greater than epsilon. So now we can look at what happens when we write this as a function of, for, for example, m. So if we write this as a function of m, we see that uh, if we want this probability uh, of this happening being at least 1 minus delta, then we rewrite the equation and we get m as a function of epsilon, which is the upper bound on the true error that we are considering, and as a function of delta, which is the probability of our, the, the hypothesis that we obtain after training having a true error below that epsilon. And as you can see, uh, we, if uh, we try to reduce epsilon uh, uh, here, or reduce the probability of going above that error, we need to increase m, because there is 1 over epsilon and the, the size of the hypothesis class there. Also, if we have a larger hypothesis class, 
we also need to increase M to keep those probabilities and uh, uh, the error bound. So basically, if we want a high probability or a low delta here for a low error, we need a larger M. And if we increase the size of the hypothesis path, uh, the, the M also increases. So we can write this also as a function of the error. If we want to lower the error, we need to increase M or decrease the, the, the size of the hypothesis class. But note that we always need to guarantee that inside our hypothesis class, there is at least one hypothesis with a true error below that epsilon. Because that was the assumption we made at first. If that doesn't happen, then it's impossible to find one uh, in those uh, conditions. Okay. So this assuming that the uh, empirical error on the best hypothesis, the one the, the, the learner gives us, is zero. Because this is, we, we started with the assumption uh, on the consistency between the training set and the hypothesis. That is, the hypothesis can classify the training set with no mistakes. Uh, but we can extend this if we uh, use Hosting's inequalities by considering that there is a non-zero empirical error. So the best hypothesis that we find has some non-zero uh, phi here, uh, an error rate. But now we can use Hosting's inequalities to uh, uh, bound, uh, to compute a bound on the generalization error, which is the difference between the empirical error and the true error. So we can do the same thing and compute the probabilities that the true error is not greater than the, the uh, empirical error plus this epsilon. So this epsilon will now be the generalization error, which is the difference between the empirical error that we're measuring and the true error. So if we do this, we get uh, this uh, expression here too. So uh, 1 over 2 uh, epsilon squared and the logarithm of the size of the, of the hypothesis class divided by delta. So basically, uh, we have here uh, a lower bound on the size of M if we want for this hypothesis class to have only a probability delta of the hypothesis that we select after training having a, tr a generalization error greater than epsilon. That is, the true error being above the empirical error only by that value epsilon. So this, uh, one of the things we can see here is this relation between the size of the hypothesis class, the larger it is, the harder it is to ensure that we have a lower generalization error, and also the size of the training set. The larger the training set, the, the better uh, things behave, or the lower the probability of going, of, uh, going outside those bounds. <coughs> now, we mentioned at the beginning that we need an inductive bias in order to be able to generalize. So if we want to, to train with one training set and extrapolate from that to uh, new examples, we need to restrict the hypothesis class in a way that's going to bias everything because we're only going to use examples from the hypothesis class. For example, we consider a linear classifier instead of any arbitrary shape or something like that. Let's see why this is the case. So suppose that uh, we have a universe X of all our examples and our hypothesis class is the set of all subsets of X. So you can choose any, any subset of X, set them to one side, and the remaining examples uh, are to the other side. This means that we have no inductive bias because whatever the function is that classifies, uh, in reality, that classifies those examples, we can replicate it in our hypothesis space because it will just be one subset of the examples on one class and another subset on the other. So suppose that this is our hypothesis class, and though, so we have no uh, inductive bias. We are not assuming anything about how to separate the examples. We can separate them in any combination uh, possible. So this means that the hypothesis class will have a number of hypotheses equal to 2 raised to the size of examples that exist in the universe. Because 
this is for each example it can either be inside the subset or not so we have two possibilities for each example so two raised to the size of the total universe of examples if we plug this in into uh, our relation between the size of the data set the epsilon and, uh, and the, uh, the delta here and the size of the uh, of the um, hypothesis space then we reach this part we can we can take this out of the logarithm and so basically the sample that we need to train so that the generalization error is below epsilon uh, uh, with a probability of one minus delta or with a probability only of delta of going over this epsilon in the generalization error will be this expression here one minus two uh, multiplied by epsilon squared so since epsilon we want it to be a small fraction not larger than one half or not larger than one definitely but small fraction here this one over two epsilon squared will be uh, a, a number larger than one and possibly quite larger than one the same thing here we want only a small probability of going above that error so delta must be a small number and this will be larger than one so basically we have two numbers here that are larger than one multiplied by the total number of examples in the universe which means that without inductive bias we would need a sample that is larger than the total number of examples in the universe in order to guarantee this, uh, this bound on the error and that is one way of understanding why we always need to restrict the kind of, of hypothesis we use because if we allow everything then we cannot put a reasonable bound on the generalization error and we cannot generalize from the training set to outside the training set now let's see this uh, uh, in a different way we're going to uh, uh, consider the look at the bias variance trade-off but more from this uh, approach of trying to estimate the the bounds on the error with some probability so this is basically the the main idea uh, uh, this, uh, behind this probably uh, approximately correct learning the approximate part is this epsilon the probably is the delta and now we are dealing with this bound on the on this value so let's suppose that this uh, uh, h star is the best hypothesis that we have in our hypothesis class the best hypothesis is the one that has the smallest true error of course we cannot find the one with the smallest true error because we cannot measure the true error so actually what we do is we find the hypothesis with the smallest empirical error the one with the smallest error in the training set uh, now the, the question here is we have this generalization uh, error on the, the uh, hypothesis that we chose which is uh, the difference between the true error of that hypothesis and the empirical error of that hypothesis but now we want to look at it uh, in a way that is similar to what we did with bias and variance decomposition so we know that the, the probability of the true error uh, of our uh, hypothesis the one we chose by minimizing the empirical error uh, being below the empirical error of the hypothesis plus this generalization error is uh, greater than one minus that that delta there so this uh, this is basically our premise and from which we derive the rest we also know that the, the uh, empirical error of the hypothesis we chose cannot be larger than the empirical error of our uh, best hypothesis because our learner is going to minimize the empirical error and give us an hypothesis that has the smallest empirical error so if the best hypothesis had a smaller empirical error that would be the one the learner would give us okay? on the other hand the true error of the best hypothesis cannot be larger than the true error of the hypothesis we got from learning because by definition the best hypothesis is the one with the smallest true error okay? so if we put these two together we can uh, uh, add up the, the bound there the epsilon and we get a relation between the true error of uh, the hypothesis we chose so the, the hypothesis the learner output and the true error of the best hypothesis plus these uh, two epsilon so now we go back to those original formulas we replace 
uh, those things there, and we can uh, reach this uh, expression here, which is that the true error of the hypothesis we chose from uh, the, the learner, so by minimizing the error in the training set, must be the smallest possible error in our hypothesis space, so this would be the error of the best hypothesis in our hypothesis class, plus this expression here that depends on the size of the training set and the size of the hypothesis size. And here we can see this uh, parallel with bias and variance. So basically, the best hypothesis in our hypothesis class is, in a sense, the bias in that uh, statistical sense, which is, uh, if this term is large, it means that we don't have any good hypothesis in our hypothesis class, and we are underfitting. So our model is biased because it cannot adjust well uh, to the, the data. On the other hand, we have this uh, term here that gives us a, an idea of how, uh, how flexible, how large the hypothesis space is with respect to the training set and how wildly it can fluctuate between the training set and outside the training set. So basically, if we have a high variance, with a, a, a large hypothesis uh, class, then this term will dominate this expression. And so here we can see the trade-off between these two things. A smaller uh, hypothesis space is less likely to have a good hypothesis there. And so that problem, the problem that all the hypotheses in the hypothesis space have a large true error, will dominate uh, uh, our, our results. On the other hand, if we have a very large hypothesis space so that anything can, can work there, then the second turn will start to dominate and we have a, a larger generalization error because we are, uh, we, uh, are trying to uh, feed too much the data and uh, uh, we increase the probabilities that the bounds of uh, our generalization error will increase. So this, so far, we've been looking at this assumption that the hypothesis space, hypothesis space is finite. So this is not really a practical uh, thing expression to use. You're not going to try to compute these upper bounds empirically. But uh, the main idea here is to get a notion that if we uh, consider this as the probability of being wrong and the relations between the different things, the sample, the hypothesis space, and so on, we can get a solid foundation on, on these notions of bias, of variance, of uh, needing to have a large data set if we have a, a very large hypothesis class and so forth. However, this assumption that the hypothesis space is finite is not really very realistic. We, we generally use infinite hypothesis spaces because we can, for example, with logistic regression, we are defining the, the hyperplane with continuous parameters, so we have an infinity of hypotheses that we can get uh, from that model. And if the hypothesis space is infinite, then this doesn't make much sense. We get a, an infinitely high bound and nothing useful from the expression. So let's see what we can do with infinite sets of hypotheses or infinite hypothesis classes. One thing that we can notice is that even though the hypothesis class is infinite, for example, for classifying this data set with logistic regression, we can set the, the discriminant anywhere here in a, in a set of continuous values, but they all give us the same result. So they are still separating this set all the same. So we can see that it's not so much the number of discriminants that we can make, which are infinite, but how well they can separate the classes that should matter here. And this uh, leads us to this notion of shattering. So uh, a hypothesis class that can be infinite, they can have continuous parameters, shatters a set of examples if, for those particular examples, any labeling that we assign them, so any combination of the two classes, in this case, we assign these examples, can be separated without error. So here I, I omitted two trivial examples, would be, which would be all blue and all red, because those uh, are not very interesting. These are the three possible combinations of red and blue with these three uh, examples. Okay? The, there is a symmetry, you can just uh, exchange red for blue, but uh, again, they give us the same result. Uh, and we can see that 
if we have three points in a triangle like this, then a straight line in two dimensions can shatter this set. Note that uh, the requirement is that uh, the points have to be classified without errors for any labeling, but the, the position of the points is fixed in this case, because it would be trivial to place two points in the same position and then the classifier would not be able to distinguish it. So you can always set two points in exactly the same place and no classifier will be able to tell the difference between them because they have the same uh, set of features. But the idea here is that we are putting the points where it's most convenient and we demand that the classifier be able to uh, classify correctly whatever the label we have. So inside our, our hypothesis class, there is always one hypothesis that classifies whatever the labels are. Uh, note that in two dimensions, there is no way of placing four points such that a straight line can shatter them. So remember that shattering is classifying correctly whatever the combinations of labels, but you can always find with four points a combination of labels that is impossible to separate with a straight line. So this means that uh, a straight line in two dimensions can shatter three points as long as we place them correctly. Of course, if we place three points in the same position, then it's not able to shatter that. But we can place three points in a way that a straight line can shatter, because whatever the labels, we can classify correctly. We cannot do that with four points. There is no way of placing four points that, for any combination of labels, you can uh, use a straight line to classify. For example, in this case, we cannot classify correctly with a straight line. So this uh, leads us to the vatnik chervonenkis dimension, which is the largest set of points that a hypothesis class can shatter. This is one of the, uh, of the ways of characterizing the power of a classifier when we have infinite uh, uh, sets of uh, uh, hypotheses. So, uh, it's not so much the number of hypotheses that matters, but the, the shattering power or the VC dimension of the hypothesis set. Now, derivating this expression is quite longer than what even I could accompany, but uh, the idea is that, again, we have a bound on the true error of the best hypothesis our classifier, our learner, produced, and with a, a probability at least one minus delta, the upper bound of the true error is below the empirical error plus some term that is on the order of the square root of the, the VC dimension divided by M and the logarithm of M by the VC dimension and then M and delta there. So basically, uh, as we increase the VC dimension, we increase the upper bound, the generalization error on uh, our uh, best hypothesis. As we increase M, we decrease the generalization error, the difference between the true error and the empirical error. Okay. Um, so roughly, if we want to keep uh, the same kind of uh, ability to generalize or to, to keep the same bounds on the generalization error, if we increase VC dimension, then we need to increase the training set too. Uh, so we saw something like this for linear discriminants. Uh, if we go back to this example, a straight line has a shattering, uh, has a VC dimension of three in two dimensions, uh, because that's the largest n uh, uh, size of the set it can shatter. But if we go for higher dimensions, for example, if we have a plane in three dimensions, then we can shatter four points. So the VC dimension of a, a plane in 3D is uh, four. That's the number of points it can shatter. I, and in general, the VC dimension of a linear discriminant, something that separates with a linear hyperplane, is the number of dimensions or the number of features we have plus one. So if we do that trick of projecting our features into a higher dimensional space with a nonlinear transformation, that means that the, feature, the examples are actually occupying the the higher dimensional space and not just a, a, a linear uh, hyperplane on that space, then we increase the shattering power of our linear discriminant. The linear discriminant in four dimensions is better able of shattering some sets than uh, in three dimensions and in five dimensions even more and so on. 
So this is what we have been doing with, uh, since the beginning when we started doing those expansions or what we do implicitly in support factor machines with the kernel trick and so on. We increase the, the vapnik chevronen dimension of our hypothesis set by going into a higher dimension space with more features, which uh, helps us uh, classify because uh, we can reach a VC dimension high enough in order to be able to classify our data set, but has this problem. It can start overfitting because we are increasing the bounds on the generalization error. Okay? So this, again, is a more theoretical framework where we can understand what are the relations between these, these different uh, factors. So to sum up, this, uh, this lecture here was especially dry, even in the, concept, the context of this course, but the idea is to give you a, a, a notion that this is not, machine learning is not just about fiddling with things and seeing if they work, uh, but there's also a solid foundation here for, for some of these uh, aspects of uh, the problem of generalizing from the training set to the test set, the relations between the power of our model, the size of the training set we need, and how the, the generalization error will be, and so forth. So, uh, for this course, this is just uh, a lecture in between the part of supervised learning and now before going into unsupervised learning, so we are not going to focus this into more detail. This is basically the, the most theoretical letter, uh, lecture of the course, but it's good for you to have a, a, a notion of these foundations, at least to know that they exist and understand uh, these relations. Okay? So if you want to read more about this, uh, chapter 7 of uh, Mitchell's book has uh, especially the first part, but it's a bit, a bit outdated, so it doesn't reach the vapnik chevronenko dimension and so forth uh, with this detail. So it doesn't have this uh, expression here, which is more recent. You can also look at uh, Alpide in a, a, a brief introduction here. But the most important part is that you understand what are these uh, different things. So what is the, the VC dimension, uh, what, what's the influence of the size of the training set, what, what this means, the bounds on the, the um, uh, generalization error with some probability. So basically uh, these notions are what's important to retain here.